All right, second question. This one's a long question. How would he answer this argument by a smart opponent of Israel who claims to be for property rights? Israeli Jews lived peacefully in Akko and elsewhere before Zionism decided to establish an exclusive homeland and kick Palestinians out and deny them their property. The idea of driving Jews out simply never existed in Palestine before Zionism. I don't think another, I don't think there's anything special about Palestine and Israel. If you turned any country into a national homeland for one group and kicked another group out and took away their property, they'd get endless conflict too. If you had property rights respected regardless of religion, ethnicity, you'd get peace. I think there's room for all Palestinians and Israelis to live peacefully together. But if the ruling regime continues to deny property rights based on religion, ethnicity, unfortunately, conflict will continue until one group is eradicated. It's looking like we're getting close to the latter outcome. I mean, I mean, this gets a number of things wrong. It, 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 the way it's conceptually framed is wrong. And the history is wrong. It, it, it is true that under the Ottoman Empire, under the rule of law that was the Ottoman Empire, for whatever good that law was, there was a rule of some law in the territory called Palestine in those days. Jews and Arabs lived fairly peacefully. Jews had to pay an extra tax because they were Jews to the authorities ultimately in Istanbul or in Damascus, where, they, where, they were, where the regional government was. But there was no Palestine. There was, uh, and there was, there was some respect for property rights. Uh, under Ottoman law, uh, Jews had certain property rights and Arabs had certain property rights. But you have to take into account that there was an overarching legal system here. Right? Now, starting in the late 19th century, Jews in relatively speaking large numbers relative to the existing population in this territory. Remember, Palestine in the 19th century was swampland. It was, it was an awful place. It, was, it had a, a very small population, uh, it, you know, focused in Jerusalem and a few other cities. Uh, there was no Tel Aviv. There was almost nothing on the coast. Jaffa, Akko, uh, Haifa. But these were, again, very, very small places. The population was very small. And uh, Jews started emigrating to uh, this area. Now, some of them had a dream of one day establishing a Jewish nation here. Some of them have a dream of, yeah, this is our ancient biblical land or whatever. But the fact is that most of them were atheists. Uh, almost all the immigrants of the late 19th century came from, uh, were coming from Russia and Germany. They were secular Jews. They were atheists. And, and most of them were just escaping from horrors of, of what was going on in their native countries. The Russians were mostly socialists who thought they could establish a communism in, in, in what was Palestine before you could get it in Russia itself. They established kibbutzim. They, they started uh, farming communities. And the only reason they could do this is because they purchased property rights again. They purchased land from rich Arabs, or, or Arabs generally, Arab farmers, they purchased land from the Ottoman authorities uh, that might have owned land. A lot of uh, the land was owned by rich Arabs in Damascus or maybe rich Turks uh, all the way in Istanbul. Um, and the other way in which they gained land, they gained property, was using, um, uh, taking possession of unused, unclaimed land, swamps, desert. Um, swamps were dried, and, and they gained property rights over those. There was no way for the Jews during this period to take anybody's land. They had no political power. They had no weapons, you know, and, and they had no facility for taking other people's land. It is, uh, but it is the case that starting pretty early on, and certainly once the Ottomans left, uh, but even, even in the late 19th century, early 20th century, during the Ottoman period, but accelerated after the Ottomans left, hostilities between Jews and, and, and Arabs increased. The Arabs noticed that these Jews were moving in. Yes, they were buying land, 
but they didn't like the fact that the number of Jews was increasing. And they started, hostility started increasing in the very late 19th century, early 20th century. Now, in 1919, the uh, 19... Uh, 19, of course, the Ottoman Empire lost uh, uh, the war, and these territories fell into the hands of the British. The British got a UN mandate uh, to, to, to manage uh, these territories. And, and during this period, uh, there were pieces of land all over the place. There were not a huge number of Arabs in the area defined as Palestine, and Palestine was never, had never been a state, never been a country, not since before the Romans had there been a country called Palestine. And Britain was in the business of divvying the territory up into states, into countries. And uh, one of the considerations, and, and uh, Jews all over Europe lobbied for, well, why don't we use this opportunity to carve out uh, the, the, this piece of territory where there are quite a few Jews and, and uh, there are not that many Arabs, they're in the majority, but they're not that many, into a future Jewish state. The Arabs have lots of state around. Uh, you know, Arabs in Palestine, if they want to live under Arab rule, they can move somewhere else, but, but create a, a state that is... Uh, that will be accessible for Jews to move into. Not to take anybody's land, not to steal anybody's land, just to move into. Move into by buying land and by cultivating land that had not existed before. I mean, Tel Aviv was a city created uh, on land that didn't belong to anybody. And uh, some of the land was purchased from Arab landowners. But a lot of it was just sand on the beach that just wasn't owned by anybody. So in the Balfour Declaration, uh, there was the declaration of a Jewish state, but not a state where land would be taken from private landholders who were Arab and given to private landholders who were Jewish. No. The idea was that the land that was not owned by anybody, not owned by any Arab landowner or any Jewish landowner, but it was owned, in a sense, the extent that you can apply ownership to this, by the British now, because they happen to occupy it, and they had basically conquered it from the, the uh, Ottomans. And remember that in most countries, sadly, even in the United States, 75% of all the land west of the Mississippi is owned by the state. So the Ottoman Empire owned most of the land in what is known as Palestine. And so the British inhabited that. So by saying, okay, much of this land, this land that will be granted to a new state that is going to be friendly for Jewish immigration and going to be a, a Jewish state, is not taking private property from anybody. There was no private property. Now then, just to fill in the history, then the reality is that from 1919, the end of World War I, through 1948, when the British left, Britain kept changing its mind about a Jewish state, yes, a Jewish state, no, a Jewish state. On a number of occasions uh, in, the, in the teens, in the 20s, and in the 30s, uh, Arabs uh, took up arms and, and killed Jews fought against the British, but mainly killed Jews. The British were trying to keep the peace. My grandfather was injured in one of these attacks in Hebron uh, while he was a student there and, and, and left, left Palestine um, as a consequence. Uh, but the Arabs, there were huge Arab uprisings where Jews were killed, like they were killed outside of Gaza. And the British brought back peace. But throughout these periods, as Jews migrated into Palestine, and the rate of migration was not very fast. It was not, not like millions came. They basically bought land. The British didn't give them anything. They bought land from Arabs, or they settled on occupied land and turned it into productive land. The property rights of Palestinians or Arabs was never violated. And it has not been violated with the one exception I gave earlier about those who were kicked out gratuitously. 
The land of the Palestinians was either taken from them because they initiated violence, but those who stayed, even those who stayed who initiated violence, got their land back. There were Arab villages all over Israel, Arab towns, Arab cities. They, the Arabs in Akko, the Arabs in, uh, what else did he, Jerusalem, the Arabs in, uh, in Haifa, the Arabs in uh, Jaffa, all still live peacefully with Jews, and their rights, their property rights have all been respected. Indeed, the property rights of Arabs have never really been violated. So this is not an issue of rights violations. Never has been a property rights violation. That's not the issue. I agree that if, if the Arabs had settled with, yeah, if Jews want to buy property, and they want to live here, fine. And, you know, if, if, as long as property rights are respected, who cares who the government is in Jerusalem or whatever? Yeah, they would, none of this would happen. We would all be living happily, peacefully in Israel, or whoever would have been, right? There are millions of Arabs who live today in Israel whose property rights are fully protected. Now, granted, Israel, like most Western states, violates property rights in all kinds of ways, Jews and Arabs. Does, does Israel sometimes discriminate against this Arab population? Sometimes, but it's minor. And they have, again, more rights than in any other country in the Middle East, and their property rights are respected more than in any other country in the Middle East. It's not, this conflict has never been about property rights. If it was, it could easily be resolved. The courts in Israel are pretty good about decide whose property does this belong to. And to the extent Israel has violated people's property rights, whether as a state or whether individuals have violated property rights, then Israel should be held to account on that. And the Supreme Court has indeed on occasion done that. They've returned land, uh, a property to Arabs whose land was taken from them illegitimately. But don't forget, what does it mean to say Palestinian land? There is no such thing as Palestinian land if you believe in property rights. If you believe in property rights, then there's the land of Palestinian, of Muhammad, his land. Nobody took his land away. Now, adjacent to his land was land that was owned by the Ottoman state and now is owned by the Israeli state. That was never his. And it doesn't belong to, quote, the Palestinians. And I don't think it should belong to the Israel, the Israeli state either. I think it should be privatized. It should be sold to the highest bidder. But we live, in a, we live in a world in which land is not privately owned, not all privately owned. We live in a world in which states own, in quotation marks, a, a significant portion of the land within their own country. Israel is no different than any other country in that regard. And to assign that God land, that, that unclaimed land, if you will, to the ethnicity of the group that happened to be a majority at any particular point in time is completely arbitrary and random. Israel established a country, and it's, again, the moral basis of Israel is the fact that it's a, it's a free country. It didn't just establish any country. It established a free country that actually respects property rights, including the property rights of Arabs.